Hey, well, welcome everybody. I think it's a great pleasure to see so many people coming for this fantastic talk. Of course, we are privileged to have Kip Thorne uh, coming and giving the De La Pietra lectures. In fact, I want to thank publicly the De La Pietra families for all the support they provide to the center, the support they provide to the university, and in particular the fact that they do fund these De La Pietra lectures, which always brings extremely famous and uh, interesting people. Now, you probably don't know who I am, but you probably know who that guy is. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let uh, all of you in uh, Keith Thorne's hands. Thank you. That's the kind of introduction I like, short and sweet. <laughs> So 1.3 billion years ago, when multicell life was just spreading a around the Earth, but in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> two black holes circled around and around each other. This is what it would have looked like to your eyes if you had been there. This is based on a computer simulation. What you see is the shadows made by the black holes against a rather uniform star field behind them. It doesn't look uniform. It has a sort of a swirling pattern in it due to what's called gravitational lensing. The light from each star can come in and it bends around the black holes, can even go around the black holes several times uh, because of the warped space and time of the black holes and their extreme gravity. And that distorts the images like uh, a mirror in a funhouse distorts the images. And so you see the swirling pattern caused uh, by that gravitational lensing. Uh, and you see the black holes gradually spiraling together because as they move, they create ripples in the shape of space called gravitational waves, which I'll describe in a little more detail in a few minutes. So the black holes spiraled around and around, neared each other, collided and merged in a great cataclysm that uh, released three solar masses of energy, that is, uh, it, it is as though you had annihilated three suns and put all of that energy from the annihilation into gravitational waves, and it was done so quickly, in about a tenth of a second, that the power output, the energy per unit time during that one tenth of a second, was 50 times larger than the power output from all the stars in the universe put together. 50 universe luminosities coming off for a tenth of a second. These gravitational waves traveled outward from the galaxy in which the uh, black holes lived and on out into intergalactic space across the great reaches of intergalactic space for 1.3 billion years until they arrived at the outer edges of our Milky Way galaxy 50,000 years ago when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals. They traveled through the Milky Way galaxy for 50,000 years, and on 14 September 2015, they arrived at Earth, touching down initially near the Antarctic Peninsula. They traveled up through the Earth unscathed, unaffected by all the matter inside the Earth, and emerged uh, at Livingston, Louisiana, sort of halfway between Baton Rouge and uh, New Orleans at a gravitational wave detector called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Seven milliseconds later, they emerged from the Earth uh, at Hanford, Washington, at our other gravitational wave detector. They shook these detectors in a way that I'll talk about in a few minutes, and uh, the signal came in. I was awakened the next morning uh, by, or when I got up the next morning and looked at my email, I saw an email from a colleague saying, go look at a su such and such internal website, we might have detected gravitational waves for the first time, humans' first uh, discovery uh, of gravitational waves. I looked at the signal, it was too good to be true. I didn't believe it. Uh, and uh, the same similar reaction, re reaction from all of my colleagues, and then it took several months for the team of 1,000 people that were working on this together to sort through all the data and be absolutely sure this was real. I'll explain a little bit about why it was so hard a little bit later. And then finally, when we were absolutely sure, we wrote a paper, released it to the world, had a press conference, 
Uh, well, these are photographs of some of the 1,000 members of the team that uh, pulled this off. Uh, and the day after the press conference, it was uh, headlines in all the uh, major newspapers and a large fraction of the minor newspapers around the world. It quickly seeped into the public, public consciousness, part of our culture. Uh, Ray Weiss, my collaborator, the primary inventor of these gravitational wave detectors, he happened to be with his uh, uh, nephew, uh, Matt Weber, in a uh, subway train in New York City two days later. Uh, and this is a photograph, it's not a, not a drawing. Uh, and uh, what that says up there is scientists found gravitational waves in outer space. If only it were that easy to find an apartment in New York City with a walk-in <laughs> closet. <laughs> and the day of that, uh, uh, the, the day after the uh, uh, press conference in the New Yorker magazine, a cartoon, what you have to know is that they signal from these gravitational waves. Uh, the signal that we saw, if you were to put it on to a loudspeaker, it would sound like a chirp, whoop, like that. And so two black holes sitting on a branch, was that you I heard just now, or was it two black holes colliding? <laughs> so I was quite amazed by uh, how quickly the word spread and uh, how much excitement there was, uh, not just among scientists, but uh, among people who were very far from science. So let me talk for a little while about how we got here in brief. So the story begins with Albert Einstein. Einstein in 1915, uh, November 1915, presented us with a new explanation for the nature of gravity, which said that gravity arises from a warping of space and time, the gravity that holds us to the surface of the Earth. But his theory of gravity, which he called general theory of relativity, it said that uh, the effects of this warping of space and time are much more rich than just uh, the gravitational force that holds us to the surface of the Earth. They included many other features, including gravitational waves. And he made the concrete prediction of gravitational waves then uh, the following year, uh, in I think June of 1916. And he said that if a gravitational wave uh, passes through a set of particles. These are a bunch of particles that somebody has laid out in interplanetary space so that they're set down and they just remain at rest with respect to each other if they were laid down so they were initially at rest with respect to each other. And what, then when the gravitational wave passes by propagating into this uh, array of particles, what it does is stretches the array in one that stretch and squeeze oscillate. A more technical way to describe this is that if you have two inertial reference frames, one here and one there, and one of the particles that rest in this inertial reference frame, the others that rest in that inertial reference frame, they'll each always remain at rest in their local inertial reference frames, but the reference frames, the inertial reference frames, inertia, moves back and forth relative to each other, something that would never occur in uh, Newton's description of gravity. Uh, so this was a radically new phenomenon, gravitational waves, but Einstein also said, in effect, uh, in the paper that he wrote, these waves from any conceivable source in the universe will be so weak that humans will probably never be able to detect them. Well, he was wrong, <laughs> but it took a century uh, for them to be detected. Uh, but it was after roughly half a century that Joseph Weber at the University of Maryland was the first person to design and build a gravitational wave detector, a detector that if, that if it had continued to be pursued for a long time, making it more and more accurate, it would likely have succeeded as well. But it didn't actually detect gravitational waves. Uh, but Weber was the uh, inspiration for me, for Ray Weiss, and for others who worked on gravitational wave uh, technology after that. And what gave him the courage to do this well, first of all, he was sort of a contrary character, a good, good friend of mine. He just, it was just an interesting challenge. But the key thing was, from the point of view of science and technology, that we now, by then, understood about two kinds of sources of gravitational waves that Einstein knew nothing about in 1916, black holes and neutron stars, that would be much stronger emitters than anything Einstein could conceive of. And then technology had come a long way since then. We had lasers, we had computers, and there were great things you could do with the new technology. And so it really was sensible to start looking in the 1960s. 
1966, uh, I uh, had just finished my graduate study at Princeton. I went to Caltech and started a theory group. Uh, I had been motivated by Weber, but also by John Wheeler at Princeton, who was my thesis advisor, uh, about black holes, neutron stars, and gravitational waves. And so I built a theory group working on this. And uh, one of the things that my students and I and colleagues did over the period of the next few years was to begin to develop a vision for the science that might, you might be able to do if gravitational waves could be discovered and uh, the information you might be able to extract from the waves about the universe. And uh, a description of what our thinking was then in the 1970s uh, it goes like this. There are only two kinds of waves that can propagate across the universe, bringing us information about what's far away, according to the laws of physics. These are gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves include light, radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays, and so forth. And electromagnetic waves uh, that astronomers use are oscillations of the electromagnetic field that propagate through space as time passes. Whereas gravitational waves are oscillations of the very fabric or shape of space and of time. Electromagnetic waves are uh, incoherent superpositions of emission from particles and atoms and molecules, whereas gravitational waves are emitted coherently by the bulk motion of large amounts of matter uh, or energy. Electromagnetic waves uh, are all too easily absorbed and scattered as they travel through matter between us and their source, and so you can lose them all too easily. Whereas gravitational waves are never significantly absorbed or scattered, not even if they're pre-emitted very near the beginning of the universe. Even in that very hot, dense matter in the early universe, they travel right through it unscathed, and can, so can bring us information, really, about the birth of the universe, and that will be what I'll talk about at the very end of this lecture. So with these enormous differences between the two types of waves, it seemed clear to us that, first of all, many gravitational wave sources would not be seen electromagnetically. And that was true of this first gravitational wave detection we made of the colliding black holes. There was no light, no x-rays, no radio waves, nothing but gravitational waves. And second, uh, that, uh, well, I should add, however, that some would be seen both with electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves. And in that case, the combined observations would have teach us a lot about the universe we couldn't learn in a, any other way. And these were likely. Every time a new kind of way is, was conceived by astronomers to look at the universe, radio astronomy or X-ray astronomy, for example, uh, there were big surprises. And he, these gravitational waves differed from the early kinds of waves so radically that we would expect even bigger surprises. And that is what I expect in the coming years. Uh, we've had very modest surprises thus far, but I expect from the observations, but I expect very huge surprises. So that was the way we were thinking about things in the early 1970s, if gravitational waves could be detected. But that was really a very, very big if. It was that same year, 1972, as, as the same year that Bill Press and I wrote our first technical paper about a vision for gravitational wave astronomy, that Ray Weiss uh, wrote a technical paper proposing and analyzing a completely new kind of gravitational wave detector, the type that is used in LIGO. Uh, and this is a detector in which you hang four mirrors from overhead supports. And when the gravitational wave comes by, it naturally pushes these uh, mirrors together because it's squeezing space, while it pushes those apart because it's stretching space in that orthogonal direction. And then with the next piece of the oscillation, it pushes these apart and those together. So you get an oscillating change in the difference of these mirror separations. Uh, and a technique called laser interferometry was to be used, Ray suggested, to measure these oscillations. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but you use laser beam and interference between the light beams that have gone into these two arms. We call these arms of the interferometer. Uh, and so uh, I heard about this. I had not yet uh, read the technical paper nor talked with Ray at the time that we were just, I was just finishing write a writing a textbook about general relativity 
together with John Wheeler, who had been my thesis advisor at Princeton, uh, and Charles Misner, who had been also a student of uh, John's at Princeton. Uh, I heard this, I looked at some numbers, it was obvious to me that Ray was crazy or stupid or something, uh, and so I was very conservative in my wording in the t that relevant sentence in this textbook. I described the idea very briefly, and then I wrote, this is not pro very promising. And it, that sits there as a landmark for those who know that I spent most of the rest of my career trying to help Ray pull this off successfully. So wh why was my reaction so negative? Well, the same reason that other physicists uh, and astronomers' reactions were quite negative initially. You just look at some numbers. You're using light to measure the changing separation between these two uh, mirrors that are hanging. And let me tell you how big that change is expected to be if you make the, uh, this whole instrument several kilometers in size, which is the size that we have in LIGO. You begin with one centimeter, and you divide by 100, you get the thickness of a human hair. Divide by 100 again, you get the wavelength of the light that is used to make the measurements. Divide by 10,000, you get the diameter of an atom. Divide by 100,000, you get the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Divide by another factor of 1,000, you get the size of the mirror motions that we expected. <laughs> One trillionth the wavelength of light. 10 to the minus 12 in technical language of the wavelength of light. This was obviously crazy. <laughs> Nobody could do that. And so, uh, nevertheless, over the next few years, I did study Ray's technical paper. In this technical paper, he described all the obstacles he could think of to success, all the sources of noise, and for e the, uh, the major sources of noise, and for each one, he described how you would deal with it and made estimates of how much noise would be left after you used the most clever uh, way that he could conceive of to deal with it. And then he got out an overall number for how weak a wave, a gravitational wave, could be detected by this instrument, compared it with the strengths of the waves that my colleagues and I were predicting as theorists, and uh, said if you make this thing a few kilometers in size, it has a real possibility of success. So I studied the paper. Then I had an uh, experimental physicist and a close friend of Hell Room when we were both in Washington, D.C. for a meeting in uh, the late autumn of, uh, of 1975. And uh, we were up all night long talking about this. Uh, I remember the light uh, starting to peep through the windows, and we had a com committee meeting the next day. Uh, but it was such a wonderful conversation. And the bottom line, after all of this, was I became convinced. <laughs> and then I did devote most of the rest of my career to trying to help these experimenters pull it off. Uh, the first step was uh, to create a research group working on this at Caltech in parallel with Ray's group at MIT. We brought Ronald Drever, a very clever experimenter who was, had already started to work with, the, with Ray's ideas and had made some uh, innovative improvements on uh, Ray's design. And we thought that uh, we really needed to have a lot of innovation to pull this off successfully. So we brought Ron to Caltech. We brought Stan Whitcomb from the University of Chicago to Caltech, and the two of them led this effort. Stan went on to become the chief scientist of the LIGO project uh, through the entire period of the project. Uh, and, and what uh, Ron and Stan did, and the team working with them, is built an interferometer that was 40 meters long. The arm lengths were 40 meters. And so imagine that's about half of a football field in length. That's 1% of the size of the arms in LIGO, 1% of what we needed. So this was a prototype. Uh, and they built it and did initial experimental work to develop the techniques and see what the obstacles were in 1980 to 83. In the meantime, Ray Weiss had started building a 1.5 meter prototype, a much smaller one in 1973, and in 1980 to 83, he was, uh, his team was working with this prototype, and he also led a feasibility study for the practical issues you would have to confront if you built a kilometer scale interferometer of this sort. Based on the results of that feasibility study uh, from MIT with Stan Whitcomb, our later chief scientist uh, participating in the MIT study, 
And based on the uh, results of the prototype experimental work done at Caltech, at MIT, also an interferometer prototype in Glasgow, Scotland, and one in, uh, in just outside Munich, Germany, uh, we founded, Weiss, Drever, and I, the LIGO project in 1984 as an MIT-Caltech collaboration. Under the auspices, the umbrella, the advice of Richard Isaacson, who was a superb physicist himself, a theorist who made major uh, insights about gravitational waves, and was then the founding uh, uh, program director for gravitational physics for relativity at the US National Science Foundation. Uh, from 84 to 87, this project, this nascent project, uh, collaboration, was run by Weiss, Drever, and me. We were the most dysfunctional leadership that the world of science has ever seen. You can read about this in Jan Levin's book, uh, uh, Black Hole Blues. And the blues refers, I think, to, to this period. Uh, and so Rich Isaacson, in 19, late 1986, convened a week-long uh, study of our progress, the progress of other groups who were working in the field, in order to try to make, uh, facilitate a decision about whether NSF should go forward and fund us to do, construct these kilometer-scale interferometers uh, and really try to pull it off in practice. Uh, that uh, study, by very hard-nosed people who were coming in from outside the field but understood all the relevant technology, said, yes, go forward and build two of them, because you can't be absolutely sure you're, you've been successful unless you see the same thing in two different interferometers widely separated. But for gosh sakes, get rid of this terrible leadership <laughs> and, and get yourself a single director who has the authority to make the two co group, research groups collaborate, truly knock heads together, and they really collaborate, and who can uh, uh, do the planning for pulling this off in reality. And so we brought on Robbie Vogt, a uh, marvelous uh, scientist and leader uh, who had been the first chief scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which uh, does all of the interplanetary missions, leads the inter interplanetary missions for NASA. Uh, and Robbie led us in writing a construction proposal for LIGO, final design and construction, in which we said we'll first build the facilities in which these uh, interferometers live. Then we will have a build uh, and operate initial interferometers, uh, which will have a sensitivity that we will probably not see anything. And then we will build advanced interferometers at a sensitivity where we should see a lot. And we had to do it in two steps because it was so extremely difficult and we were not yet mature enough in our understanding of the technology and the obstacles to do it all in one step. So it was essential to do it in this way. Uh, we had a struggle to get funded because the idea that you spend $300 million on uh, an instrument that's not going to see anything, and then you have to go in and build a better instrument was a little hard for some people to swallow. Uh, but in fact, uh, after, by 1992, NSF bought into this with enthusiasm after hard-nosed reviews by several different review committees. And Congress then bought into it, and we uh, moved forward from then until now without any significant uh, uh, reductions of budget beyond what we uh, needed to do the job. And I have to say that I am very proud of how NSF handled it and uh, Congress. Uh, whether the Republicans were in power or the Democrats were in power, things moved forward much more smoothly than they usually do on big science projects because they understood the enormous payoff that could happen. They also understood that it is good occasionally to take real risks for something that has an enormous payoff. And so, and they ha and, uh, there's great pride at NSF and in Congress over having done that, justified pride. Um, 1994, uh, we began, uh, moved forward uh, and began initiated construction we brought in Barry Barish, who had experience leading very large projects in high energy physics. Uh, and he was absolutely superb. He reorganized our whole effort. By that time, we had a group of about 50 scientists and engineers at Caltech and MIT. Barry knew this was nowhere near enough, because these instruments were so complex, there were so many things that could go wrong, and you needed so many different components that had to come together. So he built 
a group, a, a project which expanded this to include uh, uh, by now 100, 1,200 scientists and engineers at 80 institutions in 18 nations. So this is really a big science effort, but this is the only way it could be done successfully. Uh, and uh, then he led us in the construction and the initial gravitational wave searches of the initial interferometers, and then he got stolen away by the high energy physics community to lead the design study for the next generation of great big particle accelerators, which had to be a collaboration of all the major nations in the, in the world. And they came to him and said, the leaders who wanted to do this, uh, we've had discussion among the leaders of, from all of these na major nations, and if you don't take over and run this design study, it won't happen. And so he sort of regretfully left LIGO, turned it over to a new director, Jay Marks, and then David Wright, who did superb jobs of leading us then through the uh, uh, final gravitational wave searches with the initial interferometers and the installation of the advanced interferometers up to 2015, and that's when we began to see gravitational waves. However, I have to go back and say there was another component that had to come into this in order to have real success. Uh, well, two components I'm going to talk about uh, that come from the theory side. The first actually came from Vladimir Braginsky, the Russian that I mentioned to you, who is a combined theorist and experimenter. And he said, told us in 1968, think, this is way back 1968 at the very beginning. He said to us, though we didn't really quite understand what he was saying or, uh, or why at, at first, that in order to detect gravitational waves by whatever method you use, you've got to wa measure the motions of very heavy objects to such a high precision that you will see these objects, although they're human-sized objects, have fluctuations that arise from quantum theory, from quantum physics, quantum fluctuations. And in the case of LIGO, what he was telling us uh, was that uh, the center of mass, to use a technical term, of these mirrors will fluctuate due to quantum effects, just like the position of an electron fluctuates in the interior of an atom, so you can't say precisely where it is at any given time, will fluctuate by amounts that are about the same as the motions of the mirrors uh, that are produced by the, for the So the first time humans will see humanized op sized objects behave quantum mechanically, and it was necessary then to develop what is called quantum non-demolition technology to deal with this. And the development of that technology conceptually was what I put, the, my and my research group put a large fraction of our own effort into over the decades in collaboration with Braginsky's group at uh, Moscow University. And this quantum non-demolition, the first stage of it, will be implemented in LIGO this year and will be in there in the LIGO gravitational wave detectors when they turn back on uh, at the beginning of next year. I'll say a word about that later. Also on the theory front, the second thing that had needed to be done in preparation for LIGO was computer simulations of LIGO, LIGO's gravitational wave sources. I had a big worry through the whole 1980s, 90s, 2000s that it seemed very likely to me the first thing we would see was what we did see, heavy black holes colliding. And the strongest waves would come from the collision themselves, and we do not know how today, and we did not know then, to solve Einstein's equations to predict the details of the waves that come from that collision. That means that we could see the waves very likely but we couldn't be absolutely sure that this was from black holes. We could not be absolutely sure of what the properties of the black holes were unless we solved Einstein's equations to be, uh, make the predictions of the shapes of the waves to compare with the observations. And the only way we could uh, conceive of doing that was on computers with uh, big computer simulations. The effort to do computer simulations began actually in the 1950s in John Wheeler's group at Princeton and went on for some 60 years until the full success was had in the uh, mid, uh, around 2012. And we were in bad trouble, I felt the community was in bad trouble. It was not going as fast enough on the simulations uh, in the early 2000s. And so I myself left day-to-day -day involvement in the LIGO project in the early 2000s in order to start up a come from that SXS collaboration. There was a young man named Franz Pretorius who was a postdoc in our collaboration. 
uh, in 2005, I think it was, who had the first successful simulation of collision of two black holes that orbit around each other, collide, and merge. Uh, and so that was a big effort, uh, took comparably long to the experimental effort to bring uh, this field to maturity. So by September 14, 2015, the uh, detectors were turned on. They had been turned on in preparation for a gravitational wave search for several days, something like three days. And they were being brought into their final configuration. All of the different parameters that could be adjusted in these complex detectors were being adjusted to into the form that was desired for the first gravitational wave search. The first search was supposed to begin, I think it was two days later, and a signal came in. And so the experimental team froze the configuration of the detector and said, we have begun our first search and we have seen our first signal. Uh, and so it was then that uh, the, well, let me show you what the signal looked like. So this is the, the signal was much stronger than any of us expected it to be. And it was so strong it could be seen with your eyes in the data. And we thought we were going to have to dig the first signal out of the data by sophisticated signal processing. And what we actually uh, did then, what the team did, was it, uh, to use a technical phrase, it did a bandpass filtering on that signal, removed all the uh, oscillations that were at frequencies above 300 hertz, 300 cycles per second, and everything below 30 hertz, because the detectors were particularly noisy above 300 and below 30 hertz. And then this is the raw data after the removal of the noisy part of the data, and the signal at, uh, at uh, Livingston, Louisiana, and the signal at Hanford, Washington, if they're laid on top of each other, they're almost identical. And it was really quite, quite amazing to see. After, after the signals were cleaned up, and you got the gray uh, band from the SXS collaboration, uh, and the actual predicted signal depends on the masses of the black, two black holes, and also, but to a much lesser extent, on how fast they're spinning. Uh, and so we adjusted uh, the masses in the simulations until we got uh, an agreement between the observation and the theory. Uh, and the masses that came out then, this is the agreement, a remarkably good agreement, was that the two initial black holes had masses of 29 and 36 times bigger than the mass of the sun. That's a total of 65 solar masses. The final black hole after the merger was only 62 solar masses. So as I told you before, three solar masses were converted into gravitational wave energy. Uh, and the distance to the source was 1.3 billion light years. So this all came from comparing with the computer simulations. If we had not had the computer simulations, we couldn't have said this. We would have set, known roughly what was going on, but only rather roughly. We have now seen six black hole mergers. The sixth one uh, is not on this di diagram. I think the experimenters got tired of redrawing this di diagram. Uh, the sixth one was sufficiently routine that they just put the paper on the web and didn't have any press conference or anything about it. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but as you see here, and these signals, if the black holes were very heavy, then in the LIGO frequency band, you only got a small piece of the signal. If they're very light, you got a long data train. And so the heaviest pair was uh, the original pair that was seen, and it goes on down to this long data train of a 14 solar mass black hole and an 8 solar mass black hole. And the distances to the sources range up to 3 billion light years. So that's what we have so far in terms of black hole mergers. Uh, the uh, location on the sky is very important because you need to tell the electromagnetic astronomers where to look to see whether there's any light or x-rays or radio waves came from it. Uh, but the principal way that we determine the direction of the source on the sky is the time delay and when the signal arrives at our different detectors. We only had two de detectors. And that means we could not get a very accurate position on the sky. We could say it, or the signal arrived first in Livingston, Louisiana, arrived seven milliseconds later in Hanford, Washington. And so it was, uh, the source was somewhere in the south. And uh, it was down in here then on the sky, uh, on the celestial sphere. 
but a very, very big uh, error box in where it was, somewhere inside this green region. However, in August, a third gravitational wave detector went online with reasonably good sensitivity, one built by the Virgo project, 19 laboratories, 250 scientists in France, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, and Hungary. Uh, and uh, with the three detectors, it was possible to narrow down and see where the uh, source was on the sky with far, far better precision. It's still bigger than the moon, a bit, somewhat bigger than the moon on the sky, but that's good enough. That you could, uh, is really good information to give to the electromagnetic astronomers to go look and see whether they could see it. And so this was a huge breakthrough when the Virgo detector joined the two LIGO detectors in, uh, in last uh, August. And we were very lucky. Nature gave us several different uh, signals in August. And among, along with this black hole signal, there was a signal that turned out to be produced by two neutron stars that collided. Each of these two neutron stars uh, is a star that weighs roughly one and a half times as much as the sun. Uh, and it has a diameter that's something like 20 to 30 kilometers. So that's really pretty small for something that weighs more than the sun does. Uh, and the, in the interior, the density of the matter in the interior, right down at the center, is about 10 times higher than the density of the nucleus of an atom. So this, these stars are made basically from nuclear and supernuclear matter, uh, whose properties we don't understand very well. So one of the goals of studying collisions of these objects is to learn about the properties of this very strange, very dense matter. These two neutron stars, this is not a simulation. This is an artist's conception. It was actually drawn before we ever saw this uh, gravitational wave. Uh, the two black holes go around and around each other, collided and merged, and created a fireball hot, and no, almost no radiation could come out from it because of the density and, and the temperature. But as it expanded, first gamma rays could come out, then x-rays, then ultraviolet, infrared, optical and infrared, and finally radio waves, uh, things of lo longer and longer wavelength. And so, and, and th this, by the way, is what Theorists had uh, postulated uh, objects like this and had simulated objects like this on computers. And they gave this the name Kilanova before anybody ever saw such a, black, uh, such a neutron star collision. These are the gravitational wave signals. I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, what I want to talk about is the error boxes on the sky. So LIGO and Virgo together gave an error box, this long elliptical error box in here. 1.7 seconds after the black holes collided, as seen by uh, LIGO and Virgo, the gamma ray burst arrived. And it was seen to lie somewhere in this box by the Fermi gamma ray satellite. Uh, and, also, and there was also, the gamma rays were also observed by something called the integral uh, gamma ray satellite. Uh, and then when the X-rays, UV, optical, infrared, and radio were seen, a sudden brightening. It was an object inside a galaxy at that location on the sky. So this was observed by essentially all kinds of, uh, of signals that could, uh, astronomers can see except neutrinos. There were no neutrinos seen, but all, piece, all uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum plus gravitational waves. Uh, about 15% of the world's astronomers observed this thing. It's the most observed phenomenon that there has ever been in the history of astronomy. And it was really, really quite remarkable. Uh, this is what is called multi-messenger astronomy because uh, each type of radiation is called a messenger and many, um, there are many messengers. Theory says that it is these kinds of neutron star collisions that produce the gold and the platinum that are in, uh, in the Earth and elsewhere in the universe. And the observations pretty much bore that out, the spectra and uh, the, uh, the electromagnetic observations. Uh, these observations were also able, from this one event, to make a reasonably respectable measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, uh, which has only been done by electromagnetic astronomers alone with enormous effort over a long period of time. And so, 
This is basically the beginning of a whole new kind of astronomy with the combined gravitational and electromagnetic uh, observations. Let me show you the, uh, some photographs of the instrumentation. This is the LIGO gravitational wave detector in Hanford, Washington, as seen from the air. Down inside the corner building, here is the vacuum pipe down which the laser beam shoots. The mirrors are hanging from overhead supports in this uh, vertical vacuum chamber in that one. And Barry Barish, our brilliant uh, uh, director who really made LIGO happen, he likes to put a baseball player in here instead of a scientist, just to show you the size of uh, the <laughs> instrumentation. Uh, there are 100,000 data channels come out of this, uh, each of these instruments, 100,000. And that, uh, they are monitoring what's going on in the interior of the instrument and in the environment. It's hard to believe so many, but that's just a measure of how tremendously complex these instruments are. There's so many things can go wrong that it requires great complexity to deal with all of the things that could possibly go wrong. This means that these detectors have their own personality that has to be understood. I like to uh, compare it to uh, Victor Frankenstein, who built his creature and only learned the creature's uh, personality after he built it. The experimenters build this instrument, uh, these instruments, they only learn the personality after they build it. It doesn't behave quite the way it was supposed to behave, and so then you have to poke and prod it for a while to understand why it's misbehaving, and then gradually, through that poking and prodding to learn its personality, you coax it toward its design sensitivity. And we expect the LIGO detectors then to reach design sensitivity about 2020. They will then be seeing roughly three times farther than they are today, a volume of the universe three cubed or 27 times bigger, and that means instead of seeing when they're operating, when both detectors are operating properly, instead of seeing one black hole collision per month, roughly, you can expect to see a few a week or one a day by 2020. In sensitivity, we are likely to be seeing gravitational waves from spinning neutron stars, so-called pulsars, and comparing those with electromagnetic waves. From black holes tearing neutron stars apart, we've already seen uh, gravitational waves from neutron star collisions. We expect to see neutron, gravitational waves and neutrinos from the cores of supernova explosions. These are the biggest explosions that you see in the universe electromagnetically. Nowhere big as, as big as the gravitational waves from colliding black holes, but the biggest thing you see electromagnetically. Uh, and uh, it's not understood. The details of how the explosion is produced is not understood. And that will likely be sorted out through combined uh, multi-messenger astronomy observations. And then there will be enormous surprises, and if I knew what they were going to be, I would tell you. But uh, <laughs> uh, After LIGO A+, there will be further improvements. Uh, I'm sorry, after LIGO, there will be initially LIGO A+, uh, which is a modest improvement, which will bring us to seeing black hole collisions instead of one a day, probably a few a day, uh, in the early 2020s. Around the late 2020s, there uh, is likely to be, if we're con not constrained by money, if we're only constrained by uh, technology and, and technological achievements, uh, we're likely to be able to see far enough uh, with a new generation of instruments that the event rate for black hole collisions is something like one an hour. And in the 2030s, another generation of detectors, we should be able to see much farther still and we see essentially every black hole collision in the entire universe going back to the early universe uh, with masses below about a thousand times the mass of the sun. So we expect a very rapid uh, increase in the data and the discoveries. And that's just the black hole co uh, collisions. We'll see a lot of other things as I hinted at. And we will be doing gravitational wave astronomy. We, the, the community, will be doing gravitational wave astronomy not just in the LIGO's frequency band, but in three other frequency bands by the 2030s. It's as though you had opened up optical astronomy, X-ray astronomy, radio astronomy, and gamma-ray astronomy over a period of 20 years. That's basically what we expect to happen. All of these are uh, underway, uh, uh, or in the case of one of them, just on the drawing boards, but a, a, a European Space Agency mission that is likely to launch around 2030. So begin, to begin with, we have LIGO and Virgo, its partners, uh, operating it with, uh, looking at gravitational waves with periods of oscillation of a few milliseconds. 
Then we expect to have something called LISA and later the Big Bang Observer, spacecraft with separations of a few million kilometers that track each other with laser beams. And gravitational waves push the spacecraft back and, together, back and forth with respect to each other. So you see much longer wavelengths, much lower, uh, longer periods, periods of minutes to hours. So if you think of LIGO as being like optical astronomy, LISA is like radio astronomy. Then uh, we will have, we, there are now operating, but they haven't yet, yet seen anything, and they're likely to see something, I think, within the next five years or so, uh, something called pulsar timing arrays. You have an array of pulsars. These are spinning neutron stars, which as they spin, they have uh, something like a searchlight beam going out from them, and so every time it sweeps past Earth, you see a burst of electromagnetic waves. Uh, and so you have these very precisely timed bursts of electric magnetic waves coming from a bunch of pulsars. Uh, here on Earth, when a gravitational wave prop propagates over the Earth, roughly speaking, it slows down and then speeds up the clocks on Earth. And so it makes all of these pulsars look like they are speeding up and then slowing down together. And so that is the signal you're seeing gravitational waves sweeping across the Earth with periods of years to decades. And then there's a technique I'll talk about at the very end uh, by which we expect to see gravitational waves from the birth of the universe with periods of millions of years to a billion years. Now, of course, that's longer than the lifetime of a graduate student. <laughs> and, and, and so you don't sit and wait to watch them oscillate. You look for a pattern of something on the sky, which I, which I will explain. Okay. Okay, so I want to conclude by telling you a little bit about the science that we expect to do with these gravitational wave detectors, but just to give you a sample of what uh, some, some things that were a major motivations for me in working so hard for so many decades on this effort. First is exploring black holes with gravitational waves. Let me first tell you what a black hole is. A black hole is, not, is an object that's not made from matter like you and I. But rather, it's made from warped space and time. In order to visualize that, let's imagine that we uh, take the equatorial plane through a black hole, so that's a two-dimensional surface. That surface does not have the shape of a flat sheet of paper, even though it's just going right through the middle of the black hole. It's a warped surface. So to visualize that, we can embed it in a flat three-dimensional space which physicists, physicists would sometimes call the bulk. In the movie Interstellar, it's the fifth dimension because you have uh, three space dimensions. You have time as the fourth dimension, and this is the fifth dimension in, in the movie Interstellar. Um, and uh, what this looks like, then, as seen from this higher dimension, is we have the, our universe out here that is like a flat sheet of paper. You come near the black hole, and it bends down in the shape of a funnel. Uh, and uh, the, so the black hole is a funnel type, type of shape uh, as seen from the higher dimension. Time is slowed near a black hole. This is in the color coding. So where it is yellow, time is slowing at 10% of the rate that it is far away on Earth. Uh, and at the horizon, which is this circle down here, time is slowed to a halt if you hover at the horizon, which is awfully hard to do because gravity is so strong but uh, it uh, is slowed to a halt there. Uh, and the horizon looks like a circle here. It's really a flattened sphere. Uh, but I've removed one dimension, remember. I'm talking about just the equatorial plane through the uh, black hole. So if you restore that higher dimension, this circle becomes a flattened sphere. And then the black hole drags inertial frames is the technical phrase. I like to think of it as dragging space into whirling motion like the air in a tornado, and uh, it's, uh, the, the space is whirling rapidly near the horizon, much more slowly farther away, with an angular velocity of rotation that is proportional to the length of these white arrows. So this is actually a depiction of the full geometry of the warped space and time around a fast-spinning black hole, as predicted by general relativity. It's the so-called Kerr metric for, uh, in terms of technical language. Now, LISA, uh, with its uh, several million kilometer arm lengths, can look for gravitational waves from giant black holes of masses of millions of suns. And so 
One of the things we expect to see with LISA is the small black holes that spiral around large black holes, gradually uh, spiraling down in and falling into the horizon of the large black hole. But the interesting thing is that the orbit, which I can only depict in three dimensions by removing the warping of space of the big hole, so I'm removing it here now, uh, uh, the orbit is very complicated. If you can turn down the lights uh, to see this orbit, the uh, orbit uh, from a computer simulation by Steve Drasko, uh, basically it samples almost all of the space around the big black hole uh, over a period of year, a year, uh, going around and around and around uh, uh, a million times basically in a year or up to a million times in a year, a few hundred thousand times. And in sampling all of that space, it produces a gravitational waves that carry a full map of the space-time geometry of the big hole that's sampled by the little black hole as it goes around and around. And so one of the goals of LISA is to, uh, is to extract, analyze the data that come off of the small black holes spiraling around big black holes, and from those data extract high-precision maps similar to the maps that we have today of the surface of Mars. Now, what if the central body is not a black hole? For example, a hypothetical phenomenon called a naked singularity. Uh, singularities exist inside black holes. A naked singularity is a hypothetical one that is not inside a black hole. It's uh, outside the black hole horizon. They probably don't exist, but we can look for them. We can look for them by mapping the space-time geometry of a central object that is explored by a small black hole going around it. So if it's a, a particular kind of naked singularity, the orbit's near that particular chaos. And any map that you man manage to extract from the gravitational waves from such an orbit is going to be wildly different from uh, what you get for a black hole. The other thing that we're doing with black holes is studying the dynamics of warped space-time the nonlinear dynamics of warp space-time. And we, supply, we explore that observationally by computer simulations, and then we test the predictions of the computer simulations by comparing with gravitational wave observations. So here is a diagram of the warp space-time around uh, two black holes that are going to orbit each other, collide, and merge. And this is from the simulation that best matched the observations for the first gravitational wave signal that LIGO detected, again from the SXS collaboration. Uh, and so you watch the two black holes go around and around each other, color coding again is the, uh, is the slowing of time. This creates a gigantic splash, this is now a slow motion splash, like in a storm at sea, and that's the moment of collision, and then there are oscillations which gradually die out and you have a merged black hole. But it is these oscillations of the shape of space, of the uh, slowing of time, and of the dragging of space into motion, dragging of inertial frames, that are the bread and butter of uh, the uh, geometrodynamics. They are the things that Li LIGO is uh, testing. And the simulations are telling us about LIGO is testing in the six black hole mergers that we've already seen. Uh, now, this movie actually captures only a small portion of the space-time storm created by black hole collisions, a small portion of the geometrodynamics is the phrase we like to use. And I'm just going to give you a tiny flavor of what's missing. If I have a black hole that is spinning, as I told you, it drags space into a whirling motion faster near the black hole, slower, farther away. So if I suspend my wife here, uh, <laughs> above the black hole, and Carolee is hanging above the black hole, and she has a gyroscope at her feet and a gyroscope at her head, and she compares the angular velocity of the gyroscopes, which mar mark out an inertia at her feet with inertia at her head. Her head then uh, sees the gyroscope at her feet going around counterclockwise because of the difference in the rate of, uh, of rotation of space. On the other hand, her feet see her head gyroscope going around counterclockwise. You can do the experiment yourself. You take a, a wet towel and you wring water out of it. You have two ways to wring it. One is a counterclockwise twist, 
your left hand sees your right hand go around counterclockwise, but your right hand sees your left hand go around counterclockwise. So there is an absolute handedness to the twist of space around a black hole and the twist of, of a towel when you wring water out of it. So you have a counterclockwise, I like to use the word vortex, of twisting space sticking out of the north pole of the black hole and a clockwise vortex of twisting space sticking out of the south pole of the black hole. There are vortex lines that guide these twisting vortices and now just for a moment for the mathematicians and physicists in the room, these vortex lines are actually the integral curves of the eigenvectors of what is sometimes called the magnetic part of the vacuum Riemann tensor of space-time. So that's a technical phrase. I'll be giving a very technical talk about this uh, uh, and the mathematics of this and what we do with this uh, tomorrow for the physicists and mathematicians. So there's a, a lot of deep mathematics behind this that, did, that we are exploring through the computer simulations. Uh, and so to give you some flavor then of what can happen, let's let two black holes collide, one with counterclockwise vortex sticking up, the other with a clockwise vortex sticking up. They uh, collide and they merge, and this is the horizon of the two black holes. We begin with each black hole having two vortices, counterclockwise and clockwise. Now we have a black hole's horizon that has four vortices sticking out of it. Black holes don't like to have four vortices. They only like to have two vortices. And once it uh, settles down into a final quiescent state, the merged black hole will have maximum two vortices sticking out of it. And so you've got to get rid of uh, vortices. And this, in this particular case, it happens in a very interesting way. I'm going to show you then the uh, full movie from a SXS simulation. Now the merged hole is oscillating. Now it's red. Now it's blue. Now it's red. The vortices fight with each other and exchange vorticity. We never knew about this until we did the computer simulations. Uh, and uh, the, what happens actually is that once the black holes have merged, the vortex, these are the vortex lines, the blue vortex comes out of the horizon here, goes around and uh, goes back into the horizon on the back side. The red vortex comes out and goes back in. And so you have four vortices uh, sticking out of the black hole, but they're matched up in pairs. And every time the oscillation goes green, these vortex lines have popped off of the black hole. They pop off, they embrace each other, and create a toroidal uh, set of vortex lines that are uh, moving outward now at the speed of light from the black hole. As they move outward, they induce what we call tendex lines of stretching and squeezing space. It's like a moving magnetic field generates an electric field. Uh, it's a, a, a rather accurate analog of that. And so uh, as this torus goes traveling out, these tendencies of stretching and squeezing space are created. And so it, uh, my wife is stretched along that direction and squeezed along this direction uh, as, as the waves go past her. And this, in fact, is a gravitational wave. The gravitational waves consist of intertwined vortices of twitching, twisting space and tendencies of stretching and squeezing space. And so this gives you some sense that there's a lot more richness to geometric dynamics than just the, the movie that I showed you. OK, I want to wind up by saying, giving you uh, two examples of how we expect to explore the birth of the universe over the coming years using gravitational waves. The first is that we have a good shot, we think, at watching the birth of the electromagnetic force. Theory predicts that when the universe was very young and very hot, electricity did not exist, magnetism did not exist. Instead, there was something called the electroweak force. But as the universe expanded and cooled, when it was about a trillionth of a second old, this electroweak force came apart, giving birth to the electric and magnetic forces, and to something called the weak nuclear force. If that was what is called a first order phase transition, I won't go into the details of that, which it, it could well have been, but we don't know. Then this happens inside bubbles. So inside this bubble, the electric and magnetic force exist. They don't exist outside the bubble. 
And so it's like uh, draw, water droplets forming in wa out of water vapor. Uh, and you have then these bubbles inside which the electromagnetic force exists. And these bubbles expand at a very high speed, collide, and in the collision produce bursts of gravitational waves. It has very short wavelengths. This is, uh, these are very tiny bubbles when the universe is very young, a trillionth of a second old. But as the universe subsequently expands, theory predicts that these waves, gravitational waves, will be shifted to much longer wavelength and that they today will be right in the frequency band of LISA. And so one of LISA's goals is to go search for the gravitational waves produced from the birth of the electric and magnetic forces. Second example that I want to give is looking at gravitational waves from the very birth of the universe. So the universe began in what was called the Planck era, uh, the dawn of time, uh, this slide indicates. Uh, and whatever came off of that birth of the universe, the very earliest moments in terms of gravitational waves, is predicted to have been amplified enormously by an early era of extremely rapid expansion of the universe called inflation, which lasted for something like 10 to the minus 33 seconds. Very rapid uh, expansion. It did what is called parametrically amplified these uh, initial gravitational fluctuations. Conventional wisdom among theorists is that what came off of this Big Bang at the very beginning was the minimum amount of gravitational waves that is allowed by the laws of nature, by the laws of quantum mechanics, just vacuum fluctuations of gravitational waves is the technical phrase. And the conventional wisdom says the gravitational waves went out, they in interacted with the very hot gas of the universe. When the universe is 380,000 years old, and the electrons and protons in this hot gas were beginning to combine together to form neutral hydrogen atoms. And so you were losing the electrons, which previously were an impediment to the propagation of electromagnetic waves. So suddenly electromagnetic waves at that age could start to propagate. And the prediction is that the gravitational waves placed a pattern of what is called polarization on those electromagnetic waves. And that polarization pattern on what then became what we today call the cosmic microwave background should be seen in these cosmic uh, electromagnetic waves that came from the very early universe. So people who observe this cosmic microwave background, they have searched for and found this polarization pattern, but there is a foreground noise, polarization produced by emission from dust in interstellar space and now the big effort is to remove that noise so they can see what was it really came off the Big Bang. Whatever came off the Big Bang is actually a convolution, to use a technical word, or a combination of whatever came from, what, I mean, what, what we see here is a convolution of what came off the Big Bang and the influence of inflation, the amplification by inflation. So I anticipate that when this, uh, these uh, primordial gravitational waves are seen through this polarization, I hope that uh, the details of the waves are not what are predicted, and that we will conclude that whatever came off the Big Bang was not just simply so-called vacuum fluctuations. We have two shots at seeing this. One is in this polarization pattern on the sky with gravitational waves and uh, periods of oscillation of hundreds of millions of years to a billion years. And then around 2050, we hope to have a successor, a gravitational wave detector system to LISA, a constellation of detectors in the solar system that will be capable of actually seeing directly these gravitational waves from the Big Bang with periods of oscillation of seconds. So you see it with periods of oscillation of seconds by this method, with periods of oscillation of hundreds of millions of years by the other method. Uh, if conventional wisdom is right, you can predict pretty much what you'll see in both cases. I don't think that we theorists are smart enough to really get it right. I hope we're not, because life will be much more interesting if it turns out to be something else. So let me just conclude by saying that uh, it was 400 years ago that Galileo created electromagnetic astronomy by pointing uh, a little optical telescope that he built at the sky and discovering the moons of Jupiter four moons of Jupiter, and discovering uh, craters on our moon. It was two years ago that the LIGO collaboration
turned on their gravitational wave detectors and discovered gravitational waves coming from uh, colliding black holes, thereby uh, opening up gravitational astronomy. The electromagnetic astronomy that began with Galileo using instrumentation has completely changed our understanding of what the universe is all about over the period of 400 years since Galileo. And so I invite you to speculate about what gravitational waves will do for our understanding of the universe over the next 400 years. Thank you. Well, I guess that there are some questions. Why do gravitational waves that have nothing to do with light travel at the speed of light? The uh, speed of light is something that also has nothing to do with light. <laughs> <laughs> it's built into the very fabric of space and time. It's a universal speed that is a property of space and time. And light and gravitational waves feel that property of space and time, that, that piece of the structure of space and time, and uh, they obey it. They propagate along with it. Th that other kinds of waves don't do that. It's because th other kinds of waves involve a medium through which they propagate, and a medium uh, such as glass, uh, well, uh, such as water, say, for example. Uh, and that medium uh, and the properties of that medium dictate the, prop the uh, nature of the waves and the speed of the waves. But here you don't have a medium. Uh, what you have is just the structure of space and time for electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves in vacuum. And is it possible to use them, if yes? Uh, also, is there something like Maxwell's equations to describe them? Thank you. Uh, so gravitational waves do carry energy. This was highly controversial for a long time uh, because it's a rather subtle issue. And it's quite interesting. I mentioned Richard Isaacson, who is the person at the National Science Foundation who basically oversaw LIGO and really, uh, from Washington, made it happen. He was the person who did the mathematical analysis that explained how the energy is carried. For physicists in the audience, he did a geometric optics expansion or a two-length scale expansion. And uh, in that approximation, showed how the waves carry energy and they obey a conservation law of just the sort that you would expect. And so one of the great things about this project is we had a program director who had made one of the biggest breakthroughs in the theory of gravitational waves in, in the uh, decades since Einstein, who really understood this. And he also understood how to work the halls of, uh, of uh, Washington. So. Oh, uh, you had uh, your other question was, yeah, so is it possible to use gravitational waves? So I had a phone call from the uh, administrator of NASA about 1987, who happened to be a friend of mine. Uh, and he said, I'm going to talk about LISA, this LISA project that we wanted to make. I said it was early 90s. Uh, I'm giving a speech about LISA. May I speculate that astronauts in the far future will be able to surf on gravitational waves? <laughs> I suggested he not use it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you could imagine uh, something like that, but I think not, not, not really. So I think the, the one thing that they might be used for at some point by a very, very advanced civilization is communication under circumstances where you can't get any other kind of, uh, of uh, signal through. But, uh, but it'd be an awfully hard way to communicate. So, so I think basically, no, certainly in the lifetime of your great-grandchildren, uh, they will be used only to explore the universe. Yeah. Yeah. How does one estimate the uh, distance to the source of a gravitational uh, wave, and to what degree is this uh, dependent on the model of the actual collision? And how is that different in the neutron star case? So the key thing is that is, is the model. We have to have the, the theoretical uh, computations. So what we do, say, for the first signal is uh, from the changing frequency of the waves, the way that the frequency of oscillation gradually speeds up over a period of a number of oscillations, 
we can deduce the masses of the two stars or black holes or whatever they are. So we know we have two objects that were going around and around each other and we know how much they, each of them weighs. Uh, we can also uh, deduce uh, the spins if we have high enough accuracy. We haven't had good enough accuracy to get much information about that. But once you know those masses, then you can compute how strong the waves would be if the uh, source was at a given distance from you. And we see how strong they actually were. And uh, that tells us how far away they were. And so that's how, how it was done with, uh, with LIGO. Um, two questions. The first one is, does it matter how strong? I can't see where you are. Can you? Uh, stand up. Stand okay, up. Okay, okay, good. Um, does it matter, like, is there a certain limit to how strong the waves have to be to be detected? Like, if a way the gravitational waves are too small, could you not detect it? Yes, so the answer is yes, absolutely. And that's a question of how good our gravitational wave detectors are. Uh, they're at a level they have been at a level where we can detect with confidence, basically, uh, uh, the gravitational wave. If the wave moves these mirrors relative to each other by an amount that is something like, let me just do a little quick calculation, something like uh, one three hundredth the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Okay. And when we reach... <laughs> I'm not finished, and, 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 and when, or of a proton, let me take, be more accurate, of a proton, of, uh, of a hydrogen atom. And when we reach our design sensitivity after learning the waves that are three times weaker, so about one one thousandth the diameter of a proton for the motions of the mirrors. Uh, so. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming for the great talk. Uh, while we were waiting for you to come, we had to rely on a few second-hand uh, informers. And as it happens, uh, they gave us kind of contradictory uh, information. So the question is about the noise-to-signal ratio. So it, in one, one opinion says that the signal is so noisy that you have to know the theoretical prediction so well that you convolute it with the signal to, to see it. And then either the opposite opinion was that the signal is so clean that you actually see the match to the theoretical prediction. So what's the situation? Uh, both. <laughs> Question. The, the, first, the first signal was uh, so strong that you could see it without uh, any work at all. Uh, the third signal that we saw was so weak that it could only be seen after a very careful matching against theoretical templates that, uh, that came from, from theoretical analyses, from a combination of computer simulations and what are called post-Newtonian calculations for the early part of the, of the signal. Is that me? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So, um, assu uh, you spoke about advanced, very advanced civilizations using gravitational waves for possible communication in the future. Uh, my question also pertains to some potential use, to, uh, some potential observation of gravitational waves and technology in the future as well. Uh, the, say we had some theoretical spaceship engine which operated via the Penrose process or the Kerr black hole. What uh, effects would we have of gravita what, uh, gravitational wave effects should we observe while this engine is in operation? So, I, so this is a particular sort of subtle uh, kind of an engine, one that relies on extracting the spin energy of a spinning black hole uh, by throwing stuff into the black hole and getting energy out. Uh, and that process would not produce gravitational waves strong enough, I think, for anybody to detect, at least not from indiv throwing individual particles or objects in. Um, the, uh, the analog of that, something called the blanford nyack process, has, electromag has magnetic fields that thread through a black hole. And this uh, twisting of space uh, tw uh, basically tries to twist the magnetic fields and the resulting uh, magnetic field motions uh, uh, produce electric forces. And those electric forces are enormous and extract the spin energy of the black hole. This is a sort of a steady process. And to get strong gravitational waves out, you have to have something that is sort of impulsive that doesn't last for very long. 
So your version would uh, give you something impulsive, but I don't think you'd get strong enough waves to, to see any, to see. And uh, the powering of these gigantic jets that, we, that astronomers see by the blanford zayek process of twisting space, twisting up magnetic fields, making electric forces, uh, that's not impulsive enough. And so I, I think th this just reminds me of the fact that the sources of gravitational waves are very different from sources of electromagnetic waves, that uh, you, uh, see, you see very different kinds of things by the two methods. Yeah, professor, I have two questions. The, oh, <laughs> okay, I can have only one question. He, he, he's, he's a tough, he's a tough, uh, tough master of ceremony. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, for the events of two neutron star collides, we have detected the electromagnetic signals coming after the gravitational signal. So is it possible for the merge of two black holes to emit some electromagnetic signal? And is this possible to be detected? So, uh, the merger itself will not, because to get an electromagnetic signal, you have to have electric charges that move around. However, if, as is typically the case, these black holes are surrounded by a disk of very hot gas with magnetic fields threading through the disk of hot gas, uh, that disk could be disturbed a lot by the uh, black hole collision. And that could produce electromagnetic waves that might be detectable. And so that's what people have been searching for. Uh, on the other hand, on an, from an intuitive point of view, these two black holes going around and around each other will sort of uh, in the disk away from the two black holes. So I don't expect to have much, much gas near the pair of black holes. So the, so the disturbance of the disk is likely to be relatively small. Nevertheless, uh, we don't understand it well enough, and it, it's quite possible that the, we ultimately will see electromagnetic waves from this. So there's a big effort going into to searching for electromagnetic waves that come from disks of hot gas that are disturbed by the black hole collisions. Hello. I, I wanted to ask how gravitational waves might provide insight into the clumpiness of the universe. Um, Again, this is something where uh, it's hard to get insight because the clumpiness of the universe, by and large, is a pretty quiescent thing. The lumps are there, but they're not doing much rapidly. We can only see gravitational waves from stuff that is moving, or, well, with LIGO or LISA, stuff that is moving around, doing a lot of motions with uh, periods uh, that are no more than hours. And, uh, and so, the clumps have to be pretty small and pretty dense then to produce uh, 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 gravitational waves with those kinds of periods. So uh, we just, there are wonderful questions in astrophysics that we would like to answer that we can't uh, make progress with gravitational waves on. But there are lots of questions that we never could begin to ask about before that we can make progress with gravitational waves. That there are plenty of questions, but maybe this is a good moment to, to stop. One thing we've learned is that many years ago, Carl Sagan told us that we were made of stardust. <laughs> now he's telling us that we are also made of nuclear waste. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.